Okay, um, so there is exam one coming up. Um, I guess it's two weeks from yesterday for the night class and two weeks from today for this class. Um, so Wednesday, um, 212 in room S1326 at 6 p.m. That's for the night class. And then Thursday, 213, 1330 uh, at 11 for this class. So you can go to either one of those. Um, and I still haven't totally decided what material is going to be on it. Um, definitely particles, so uh, the topics. Uh, definitely um, harmonic motion. And definitely waves. And then we'll see what happens over the next couple of classes with this new material. But I think it's pretty likely that it'll just be those two. Um, so you should be, you know, at this point, well into working on those practice problems. And if you're not yet, then uh, you better get going soon. Um, and please feel free. So I, I still haven't really had anybody show up to office hours on Mondays and Wednesdays. Um, so remember that that, you know, that I'm there for office hours three to six on Mondays, four to six on Wednesdays. Um, and you can just sit in a classroom, work on problems, ask me when you get stuck. Um, and I'd be happy to look over your work on practice problems, um, tell you what, what's okay with me and what's, you know, simplifying it too much or whatever. Um, that seems to help people a lot. So, uh, all right. Uh, anybody have any questions from last time? So we talked about, the last thing we talked about was this sumo suit. Uh, so let me back up for a second. Uh, so now we're going on to talking about temperature and kinetic theory. That's the relationship between the, um, the physics of microscopic particles in a material and uh, the macroscopic behavior that we observe. Um, we're going to talk about this mostly in terms of gases. And then uh, we're going to go from this to talking about heat. And then we're going to go from heat to talking about thermodynamics. So you can think of this all as now like a big setup to talking about thermodynamics. And thermodynamics is essentially um, talking about how to use heat to do mechanical work, like in a heat engine, a steam engine. Um, so right now we're on temperature and kinetic theory, and I talked about the sumo suit analogy. Anyone remember what, the, what was the overall point of the sumo suit analogy? Why did I bring that up? Besides to draw a funny picture, because I do like to do that, too. Yep. Right. When they're farther apart, moving fast, people in sumo suits are just like rubber balls. And rubber balls are easy to do calculations for. Um, and um, so far apart and fast. Uh, means um, easy calculations. And um, so uh, this is essentially what happens when a material is in its gas phase. So that's essentially what's happening microscopically uh, 
um, in gases. Okay, they're, they're really far apart, they're moving fast, and so when they do come in contact, all they do is bounce off of each other. They don't have time to do the complicated things that, um, that materials do when they get close. They tug and push and um, so, uh, the first thing, the first calculation I want to do is I want to show how much extra space a molecule or an or a atom has when a material's in its gas phase compared to a solid phase. So I'm going to take two materials. Um, I'm going to compare, uh, so, how much more room does an atom or a molecule have in the gas phase than in the solid phase. Um, and the way I'm going to do that calculation is I'm going to calculate the volume available to each molecule or atom um, in air which is a gas, and solid copper. Um, and the way we're going to do this calculation is we're going to figure out, um, so the steps are basically this. Um, we're going to you know, from a table or the internet or whatever, we're going to look up the density of material. Um, that's given as a mass per volume. That's what density is. Um, and then we're going to look up the mass per atom or molecule on the periodic table. And on the periodic table, uh, oh, we don't have one in this room. Well, um, the squares on the periodic table for every element, um, it'll say, like, it'll give the element name over in this corner, it'll give the atomic number here, and it'll give the atomic mass in the middle. This will be given as a decimal with a lot of decimal places. Okay. Um, and this is the um, mass of the atom in atomic mass units, okay? We're going to have to convert that to kilograms, um, but there's just a standard co conversion between this unit of mass and, and kilograms. So one U is equal to 1.6605 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Okay, so if we take the, um, if we take the, uh, mass per volume
Actually, sorry, but we have to do this a different way. If we take the um, if we take the mass per atom and then multiply it by the reciprocal of the density, which is the volume per mass, these masses cancel and we get a volume per atom. And that's what we're trying to figure out. Okay. So what we're going to see is that the volume per atom in a gas is greater than the volume per atom in a solid. And the question is how much. Okay. Um, So one other thing I should say, so notice um, in solids, um, atoms form lattices. Uh, so you'll have something like an atom here, an atom here, here. Um, these all bond in a certain way. And so you get a characteristic pattern where these are all atoms. In gases and liquids, atoms bind together to form molecules. And then those molecules move as units. So for example, when we talk about air, um, air is mostly nitrogen. Uh, nitrogen gas forms N2 molecules, so you just have like a nitrogen and a nitrogen bonded, and this thing follows its own path, bumping into other molecules of, of N2, of nitrogen. So that's, so when I say atoms or molecules, I'm just talking about whatever unit in that gas or liquid or solid um, behaves as, as its own thing. The molecules and atoms we're talking about for gases and liquids, uh, um, the molecules we're talking about for gases and liquids, the atoms we're talking about for solids. Um, okay. Any questions so far? I haven't really said anything yet. Um, okay, so let's first do solid copper. Um, so you can look up the density of solid copper and uh, you get a value of 8.9 times 10 to the third kilograms per cubic meter, okay? Um, so that says that if you had a box of copper that was this big by this big by this tall, it would weigh 8,900 kilograms. Um, Now, if you look on the periodic table, um, one copper atom has a mass of 63.55 U. Um, so we're going to start with 63.55 U per atom. 
and we want to convert that into kilograms per atom just so that we can uh, do a calculation with this density value that we have in kilograms. Um, so 1u is equal to 1.6605 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. The u's cancel, and you get a value of 1.055 times 10 to the minus 25th kilograms per copper atom. So now we want to multiply the mass per atom to the reciprocal of the, of the density. So we have 1.055 times 10 to the minus 25 kilograms per atom times 1 cubic meter over 8.9 times 10 to the third kilograms. Those cancel, and you get a volume per atom of 1.185 times 10 to the minus 29th cubic meter per atom. Um, that brings up something that is going to come up a lot in this topic. When we're talking about the microscopic properties of atoms and molecules, we're going to be dealing with these. We're going to be dealing with big values for velocities, and we're going to be dealing with tiny values for volumes and masses. And so you're just going to have to get used to, um, to using scientific notation for all these calculations. Um, you're not going to want to write 1185 and then uh, 28 zeros. Okay, so now let's do air. Um, okay, I did this in my notes in sort of a um, more complicated way, but uh, let's just do the simple way. Let's just assume uh, assume that air is made up of nitrogen gas. Um, that wouldn't be very good for breathing, but uh, N2 makes up about 80% of air anyways. So we'll just assume that it's 100%. It's a reasonable first approximation. Um, the density of air um, at, and you have to make a couple of assumptions when you're talking about a gas, that, so let's talk about um, at standard temperature, standard one atmosphere of pressure, you get a density of 1.29 kilograms per cubic meter. So if you had that same box that's this wide, this deep, this tall, filled with nitrogen, that nitrogen in that box would weigh 1.29 kilograms. Um, the periodic table says, um, the mass of a nitrogen atom is 14 U. Okay, that's a nitrogen atom, but we're talking about nitrogen gas that forms these two atom molecules. So an N2 molecule has a mass of 2 times 
14u, so 28u. And now we want to convert that to kilograms. So 28u per molecule, where 1u is equal to 1.6605 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. And you get a value of 4.65 times 10 to the minus 26 kilograms per molecule. So now we want to multiply the mass per molecule times the reciprocal of the density. So 4.65 times 10 to the minus 26 kilograms per air molecule times the reciprocal of the density. The kilograms cancel. Can someone, what's 4.65 divided by 1.29? Okay, so 3.60 times 10 to the minus 26th cubic meters per molecule. Okay, so those are both, you know, tiny, tiny numbers. The volume per atom in copper was 1.185 times 10 to, the, um, 10 to the minus 29th. For air, it was 3.6 times 10 to the minus 26th per molecule. So how do we compare those two? Like, we're looking for a ratio of those volumes. Um, so I'm just going to take the volume per molecule of the air and divide it by the volume per, per atom in the copper. And so you get 3.60 times 10 to the minus 26 meters cubed per I'll say per unit. Um, and for the uh, copper, we had 1.185 times 10 to the minus 29th cubic meters per unit. And what do you get? Can, can someone divide those? Three thousand thirty-eight. So an air molecule has 3,038 times the volume a copper atom has. OK, so you know, that's a ton. That's a big difference. Um, as far as liquid, um, and I think I mentioned this at the end of class last time, you might think, you know, liquids and gases and solids are all so different. You know, you would probably think uh, that the volume per liquid molecule would be somewhere in between these two. Uh, a liquid is so different from a solid. But it turns out that liquids and solids uh, there's not too much difference between the amount of space per atom or molecule. Solids and liquids, everything's close together. Gases are the one where things change a lot. So liquids, you'll just have to trust me on this. We could do a calculation, but I'm just not going to do it. Um, have about the same space per molecule that solids do. So gases 
are the one phase where volume per unit is drastically increased. Okay, so in solids and liquids, um, the, the atoms and molecules are in close to each other, wrestling with each other, pushing sometimes, pulling sometimes. With gases, they're being launched at each other and just bouncing off of each other. And that's why we're going to do these calculations primarily with gases. But it turns out that uh, when we get to thermodynamics, um, gases are like a lot of really important calculations have to do with gases. So it's not too much that we're giving up here since we're developing for thermodynamics. Any questions on any of that? Okay, so we'll do mostly gases. Um, so now, uh, I said that this section is talking about the relationship between microscopic properties and macroscopic properties. So now um, we're going to talk about the first macroscopic property that's going to be important to us, uh, and that's temperature. And I just have to say a few things about uh, the different units, measurements of temperature, how they relate to each other. So the first important macroscopic quantity is temperature. Um, and loosely speaking, uh, temperature is a measure of um, the kinetic energy of atoms or molecules. So um, as, a single, um, as a single material's temperature increases, the speed of the molecules are increasing. OK. Um, and you know, since uh, kinetic energy is has mass in there too, um, a gas that has more massive molecules, the molecules don't have to be moving as fast to be at the same temperature as a gas with less massive molecules. Okay, so temperature is a measure of molecular kinetic energy. Um, there are three sets of units uh, the first one is Fahrenheit, and I'll write that degrees capital F. The second one is Celsius, and then the third one is Kelvin. I'll just write that with a capital K. And um, this one is, so first, uh, the SI units are Kelvin. And Kelvin is important in chemistry and physics. Um, because Zero Kelvin, that's not okay, that's zero Kelvin, uh, represents something that's significant physically.
and that is absolute zero. where all motion stops. Okay, so um, the nice thing about the Kelvin scale is um, zero Kelvin is actually the limit of how cold things can get. Okay, and that makes it useful and we'll see that it comes up in a lot of calculations um, because that's actually something relevant. Fahrenheit and Celsius scales, zero on those are chosen, you know, relatively, compared to Kelvin, they're chosen just sort of at arbitrary places. Um, and so we need to talk about conversions between these three systems of units. Um, so in converting between these, between temperature units, Watch out. Um, so this is a major source of errors. Um, conversions are, the conversions are different depending on whether you're talking about, okay, so they differ depending on whether you're converting a temperature at a single instant or second, a change in temperatures. So, um, for example, um, it's 80 degrees outside, is a temperature at an instant. Um, but it's 10 degrees colder than yesterday. Is a change in temperatures. And depending on which of those situations you're dealing with, you have to do the conversion differently. Um, Okay, so if you're talking about changes in temperature, um, a change in Kelvin temperature is the same thing as a change in Celsius temperature. So if the temperature goes up three degrees Kelvin, it also goes up three degrees Celsius. And a change in Celsius temperature is equal to five-ninths of a change in Fahrenheit temperature. So if it goes up three degrees Fahrenheit, it goes up 15 ninths, uh, what's that, five-thirds um, degrees Celsius. Okay. If you're converting temperatures at a single instant, then the Kelvin temperature is equal to the Celsius temperature plus 
and the Celsius temperature is equal to 5 ninths times the quantity Fahrenheit temperature minus 32. So with these, um, you can go from, you know, you can go from Fahrenheit to Kelvin just doing it in two steps. You can go from Kelvin to Fahrenheit and, you know, you can obviously go Celsius to Kelvin, Fahrenheit to Celsius. Um, so based on this, uh, what is the temperature, what is absolute zero in degrees Celsius? That's right. So if, so... Um, absolute zero is when the Kelvin instantaneous temperature is equal to zero, right? And so now you can just solve this for C, subtract 273 from both sides, and you get that you're at absolute zero when the Celsius temperature is equal to minus 273 Celsius. Um, so uh, intuitively, what causes this we haven't dealt with that with other kinds of units before. What causes this split between how we treat changes and how we treat uh, instantaneous temperatures? Chaos theory? <laughs> yeah, so specifically, yeah, specifically it's the fact that they all have their zeros at different places. Okay, that, that puts a constant into these calculations that cancels out of these calculations. And every other system of units we've used before, you know, like if you think about feet and meters, at least they agree about what zero is, you know. These don't even agree about what zero is, which is a really uh, uh, troublesome disagreement, you know. And so you're, you're just going to always have to ask yourself, am I talking about a, a change in temperature or an actual temperature? Um, you could do that. You could do that. Um, so you could, so uh, let's see. Let me do a, let me do an example and I'll do it, I'll do it both ways. Um, so let's say the temperature drops 15 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, what's the temperature drop in Kelvin? Well, uh, is this a change in temperature or an instantaneous temperature? Yep, this is a change. So um, we have that the change in Celsius temperature is equal to 5 ninths of 15. And so, uh, sorry, uh, it's a change of, actually, this is probably worth mentioning. Um, a change in temperature is equal to the final temperature minus the initial temperature. And so our change in temperature is equal to uh, the final temperature is 15 degrees lower than the initial temperature. So this is negative 15. And so the change in Celsius temperature is equal to 5 ninths times negative 15, which is negative 8.33 degrees Celsius. Um, and so then the change in Kelvin temperature, that's the same as the change in Celsius temperature, so you just get this. Uh, what would you get if, if you used the wrong one? 
Um, so like if you wrongly used um, that the Celsius temperature is equal to minus 15 degrees Fahrenheit times let me write this a better way so let's say that uh, if you assume that the Fahrenheit temperature was minus 15 then you'd get that the Celsius temperature is equal to 5 ninths times minus 15 uh, minus 32 And so you would get a value of, can someone calculate that? I don't have this. Uh, 5 ninths times minus 47. Okay. Point one one um, degrees Celsius. And then the Kelvin temperature uh, would be this plus 273, and you'd get a value of about uh, positive 248 uh, or so, 47. Okay, and if you think about what this says, that doesn't make any sense. Um, if the, tel if the temperature goes down in Fahrenheit, it's not going to go up in Celsius or Kelvin. Um, and so you'd get the wrong answer here. But what you could do, and this is what you were asking, Andrew, I think, um, is you could just say, uh, you could just like pull two temperatures out of the air and say, um, T final is equal to 35 degrees Fahrenheit. T initial is equal to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. Um, so this tells you that the change um, in Fahrenheit temperature is minus 15, which is what we want. Okay. And then you could you could do the instantaneous conversion to 35, the instantaneous conversion to 50, and you'd end up getting the right thing. So don't, Andrew asked. I wasn't even gonna bring that up. But you can forget about all that and just do this. <laughs> um, any questions about that? Temperature conversions? All right, um, every material has three phases. Solid, liquid, and gas. Um, and all of these, for each of these, uh, in some sense, increasing the temperature leads to an increase in size. OK? That's called thermal expansion. Um, but what size means for each of these phases is different. Uh, if you have a solid, um, you know, like this pen, no matter what kind of container I put it in, it's going to still have the same length and the same, and the same width, right? So all its length dimensions stay the same. That's something a solid does. 
But a liquid doesn't do that, right? If you took, if you took a container of water that had a length of two inches and poured that water into a cup, you know, that has a circular cross section with only a one inch diameter, the water will happily change all its length dimensions to fit into the new container, right? And so right there, you know, solids and liquids, talking about a size change, you're gonna have to use a different way of describing it, okay? And then a gas is different still. Um, if you have a gas that's held in a, a vial this big, and you open it into a container that's this big, the gas will happily expand to fill the entire new container. So again, when we talk about size with a gas, we're talking about a different thing than size with a liquid or with a solid. Okay, but <clears throat> I'm gonna use this idea of thermal expansion. Uh, I'm gonna talk about how to calculate the thermal expansion of a solid. Then I'm gonna talk about how to do it with a liquid. And finally, I'm gonna use that idea to talk about thermal expansion in a gas. And in a gas, the thermal expansion equation ends up being the ideal gas law, which we're gonna use all the way through the rest of talking about heat and talking about thermodynamics. So we're going towards a really important result here. Um, so, I'm going to start by talking about thermal expansion in solids. If you raise the temperature of a solid, the solid's length increases in every direction. And this increase goes according to the formula the change in length over the initial length is equal to a constant alpha times the change in temperature. Alpha is called the coefficient of thermal expansion. And uh, you have to find that for each individual solid material that you're talking about. So it must be looked up for each material. Um, and you can just do that with Google. Uh, you know, look up coefficient of thermal expansion, copper or steel, and it'll give you that value. Um, a couple of values that will come up a lot, like in the practice problems. Uh, steel has a coefficient of thermal expansion of 12 times 10 to the minus 6 degrees Celsius to the minus 1. And notice the units of the coefficient of the thermal expansion. Um, you just have to have, so this is a length over a length on the left side. And so each side of this equation has to be non-dimensional. It has to have no units. And so for the right side to be non-dimensional, since the change in temperature is in Celsius, the coefficient of thermal expansion has to be in one over Celsius. So that's where the units come from. Um, and then glass. has a coefficient of thermal expansion of 9 
times 10 to the minus 6 degrees Celsius to the minus 1. Uh, this is kind of an interesting thing. Pyrex glass, uh, you know, that lab equipment is made out of, has a coefficient of thermal expansion considerably smaller than this. I can't remember what, maybe 2 times 10 to the minus 6 or something. Um, can you think of why that would be important in, in lab equipment? Yeah, right, because, because it, won't, it wouldn't be bad if the whole thing expanded exactly uniformly. Your, your thing would just grow a little bit, and that wouldn't be a big deal. But what is a big deal, and the way it usually happens, is one corner is heating up faster than the other corner. And if you get the size changing on one side when it isn't changing much on the other side, uh, eventually it cracks the glass. And so that's the benefit of this, of Pyrex glass, uh, when you're changing the temperature. Okay, uh, let's do an example problem. So let's say between two walls, we have a spring with a spring constant of 10,000 newtons per meter. And let's say that at its initial temperature, the spring applies no horizontal force to the walls. Um, as the spring expands, it applies a force, um, F equal to K times the change in the resting length of the spring. outward to the walls, um, and the question is, what's the force if, so what's the force applied by the spring if the spring's temperature goes up 100 degrees Celsius? Uh, oh, and I need to give a length. So let's say that the wall is, these are one meter apart. Um, the equation for, for thermal expansion says the change in the length over the length and our over the initial length and our initial length is one is equal to uh, the coefficient of thermal expansion and I guess I'm saying this is a steel spring so the coefficient of thermal expansion is 12 times 10 to the minus 6 what's the change in temperature is it positive 100 or negative 100 it's positive if it's increasing, so times 100. <clears throat> and now uh, you solve for the change in length, and you get a value of 1.2 times 10 to the minus 3 meters. Okay? This is the change 
in the spring's resting length. And so the force is the spring constant uh, times the change in the resting length. And so you get a value of 12 newtons. Um, so even though for a spring that's a pretty stiff spring, uh, 12 newtons doesn't seem like a real big deal. But um, if that was instead a steel bar, uh, you can think of a steel bar as being just an exceptionally strong spring where, where this spring constant would be in the, uh, would be about 200 billion, I believe, if I'm thinking of, about it right. And so in that case, um, this change in length would be a serious problem if you had built these two walls expecting that length to stay constant, you know. And in a lot of engineering applications, thermal expansion is something that has to be considered. And you know, um, like right now, uh, with the weather like it is right now, you know your car sounds terrible when it's been sitting outside below zero and you turn it on. And that's because um, everything in your engine has changed sizes. <coughs> and it's changed sizes in different amounts. And so the pistons aren't, aren't fitting into the cylinders the way they're supposed to. And uh, so that's just one example of like an engineering application where this is a really critical thing to consider. <clears throat> Any questions about that? Okay, so, uh, oh, one thing that you should notice is what happens to the hole of a hollow material like this So what happens when this ring expands? Well, um, you might think that this thing expands and pushes material into the middle, but that's not how it works. Any measurement that you take in any direction expands. Um, and so the diameter of the hole expands according to the thermal expansion equation. So whether there's material there or not, in a way, like this makes the calculations a lot simpler. Um, whether there's material there or not, you can just take any measurement you want along a body, and that measurement is going to increase as you increase the temperature. Okay. So um, this length increases, this length increases, the diameter all the way across, increases, whatever measurement you take. Did you have a question? Well, I guess you can think about it like this. So what, as this material starts to get, um, so to get bigger, what's happening, remember I said, uh, that increasing temperature is increasing, um, it's increasing kinetic energy. So it's increasing speed, right? 
So all these molecules are vibrating faster and faster. And the faster they vibrate, the more they're bouncing away from each other. It's harder to push them close together. So as the temperature increases, the, the atoms in the solid get farther apart. And if all the atoms get farther apart, think of the atoms on the surface, the inner surface of this ring. If they get farther apart, the perimeter is getting bigger. And the only way for the perimeter to get bigger is for the diameter to get bigger. OK. Any other questions? OK, so let's go on to thermal expansion for liquids. Um, like I said, liquids, we can't use the same equation because a liquid doesn't have any intrinsic length. It takes the length of whatever container you put it in. But no matter what container you put a liquid in, its volume doesn't change. So it does have an intrinsic volume. Um, and so, if you think about it that way, the thermal expansion equation for a liquid looks exactly the same as for a solid, except we're dealing with volumes instead of with lengths. Uh, so, you have the change in volume over the initial volume is equal to some constant, and I'm going to call that constant, not I'm going to, I didn't choose this. Uh, people call that constant beta. Uh, times the change in temperature. And beta is again called the, ther the coefficient of thermal expansion. And so you have to be careful when you're looking up coefficients of thermal expansion, you have to make sure that you're looking at the right phase. Because the liquid coefficient of thermal expansion for steel is not the same number as, as the solid coefficient. Okay. Um, so one value uh, that I'm going to use in an example is mercury, liquid mercury. Um, the beta value is equal to 180 times 10 to the minus 6 degrees Celsius to the minus 1. And um, I'm going to use mercury in this example because uh, that's how thermometers used to be made, with liquid mercury inside. And the, the way that the mercury climbs up the thermometer is just a is just a thermal expansion. Uh, there's a ball of mercury at the bottom of the thermometer, and when the temperature increases, the volume of the mercury increases, and it makes it climb up this thin strip up the, up the thermometer. So here's an example. Um, so let's say, you know, my, uh, my grandma used to just let us play with mercury. You're not supposed to do that. <laughs> I could have been something. <laughs> um, So um, you have a ball here, 
you have a thin tube here. Uh, this is all filled with mercury. And let's say that this volume is 3.5 times 10 to the minus 7 cubic meters. And let's say that the cross-sectional area of the tube is 1.5 times 10 to the minus 8 meters squared. Um, at room temperature, um, the mercury exactly fills that bulb. So um, any increase in volume goes up the tube. And so um, we need to calculate, you know, we need a way to calculate the volume of a tube. Um, so any cylindrical solid, uh, any prismatic solid, meaning that the cross section is the same the whole way along, the volume is equal to the cross-sectional area times the height. And since um, this has a circular cross-section, we can come up with a formula for the area. That's just pi r squared. So this is going to be pi Oh, actually, so we don't even need that for this because I gave you the cross-sectional area. If we knew this was a, was a circular cylinder, um, I could have given you the radius here instead, and you could do this calculation. But we know that uh, whatever change in volume we get, um, due to thermal expansion is going to be equal to AH. All right, so the thermal expansion equation says the change in volume divided by the initial volume. Oh, and I have to give a temperature here. Oh, yeah, so let's say... Um, Let's say the change in temperature is positive 16 degrees Celsius. What? Yes. And so since it's exactly, so if it's exactly full at room temperature, then any extra volume is just in the tube, and we don't have to worry about the we don't have to worry about the old volume that's still you know this will still be full, and there'll be a little extra volume that goes up the tube. Yep. Second. Yep. Any other questions about? Eric, does that make sense? Or? Oh, this is a change in temperature. Oh. Yep, you're right. So say it goes from room temperature up to whatever. Um, OK, so the change in volume over the initial. Yep. So everything, the mercury is just getting bigger and not right. like the amount isn't changing. Not the amount of molecules, but the molecules are getting further apart. Okay. And that's making the volume increase. OK, so the initial volume is 3.5 times 10 to the minus 7. That's equal to the coefficient of thermal expansion 
180 times 10 to the minus 6 times the change in temperature. And if you solve for delta V, you get a change in volume of 1.0 times 10 to the minus 9. And now we know that this change in volume is equal to the cross-sectional area times the height. The cross-sectional area is 1.5 times 10 to the minus 8. And so the height is 0 0.067 meters or 6.7 centimeters. Any questions about that? Okay, so uh, let's stop there for today, but next time we're going to talk about the important one, the most important one for us. We're going to talk about how gases expand when you increase the temperature. And like I said, that'll take the form of the ideal gas law.